All right. All right. Hi, I'm Susan Feller, and I curated an exhibit that is traveling from the middle of 2023 through the entire year of 2024, and its title is Stories Are Made Loop by Loop. And today I'd like to have a conversation with Dominica Zara Queen from West Virginia. Well, let me first tell you why I decided to select Dominica's work and the particular piece that she has in the exhibit, its benefits. I was fascinated by her uh, very dedicated approach to using waste material only, and in this case, plastic plastic bags and such. Um, there's a plentiful amount of them. And she's searching through, trying to use this strange material um, as fibers for all the heritage handworks that um, she's learned throughout the years. So would Dominica, would you share your screen and show us some visuals and tell us some more about your story, please? Yeah, absolutely, Susan. Thank you so much for including me um, in this exhibition. I'm really excited to share a little bit more of my work, but we can start with the idea of plastic being an heirloom. Um, can you see my screen pretty well? Are the slides up? Yes, they are. Looks great. Okay, wonderful. So um, one of the concepts that has come to me as I've been working with plastic is that it's an heirloom. And by that, I mean, it's not truly disposable. Uh, plastics we're using right now will remain for hundreds of years. Um, the image that's on the screen right now is a very small piece, and it is in a little mason jar lid. It's a hand-stitched embroidery using some ribbon techniques and some um, basic stitches on plastic, and it's all plastic grocery bags. And this small piece is called chicory preserves. So in that, I'm playing with the idea of um, you know, what types of preservation can happen, both with like craft techniques, um, putting up things for the winter. It's very Appalachian and it also speaks a little bit about the longevity of plastics. But the first work that we'll look at in depth is On My Belly in the Grass. That's the work that is in the stories are made loop by loop show. And um, you can see that it doesn't immediately look like it's made out of plastic bags. Um, and I'm trying to use the context of heritage crafts like rug hooking and like embroidery, all of these very slow methodical handworks um, that are present in fiber arts to push back against the current context of plastic as being like a speedy single use disposable disposable. And I um, I intentionally pour tons of hours <laughs> into pieces like this. So it takes a really long time to, you know, find and collect all of the different shades of green that you see in these this piece. Um, there are a couple different shades of teal that come from two different grocery stores locally these uh, very light sort of sparkly greens that catch the sunlight that's coming through. They are, um, uh, you know, those puffy pillows that you get in Amazon shipments and other, you know, they're usually full of air. There's a particular brand of them that just has a little bit of green in it. And there's also another brand of them that has a little bit of a blue tint to the translucent. So you get kind of a sparkly effect to it. So there's a lot of thought that goes into assembling the materials, but also making them shine in a way. So it it is just really satisfying to me <laughs> to be able to combine, like contrast the usual context of these materials with a heritage heirloom fiber arts method and attitude. Um, and then, of course, in addition to the time it takes to do the manual labor of producing these works, there's also another layer of like deep time 
that comes from the fiber arts techniques I use. So we've been working with fiber arts for tens of thousands of years in different ways. Um, the last number I fact checked on that, and people are discovering things all of the time, but the last number I saw was we've been sewing for 45,000 years, <laughs> which is just unimaginable. Um, and uh, I started with rug hooking, but plastic really does make a very versatile material, um, which is honestly part of the problem. It's why it's everywhere. <laughs> but you can do all kinds of things with it. Um, this is another one of my rug hooking pieces. It's a little bit smaller. It's about six inches across and it's a honeycomb. Um, we also have another piece that is embroidered. It just uses a very basic um, back stitch to make this floral design sort of to look like a bouquet of dried flowers. Um, I've also used these plastics in um, a tufting gun or like the E.B. Ross & Co. machine, which is a, a mechanical process. It's not electrified. It's basically the same thing, though. Um, I've also warped a table, a table loom with plastic. So I've just processed the plastic bags into long strands. Um, and with all of those different techniques, I can get a lot of different um colors and materials so like here's another big piece that I did um this one's called Primavera which is all about like the shapes of spring and all about these natural forms um and then I can also do things like this um which is the green one and it's actually a mask that you can take off the backing and wear and then put back and it has magnets attached to it. And so this is back to those embroidery techniques sort of layered over one another. And all of these materials, except for the rug backings are reclaimed. And I've started to find ways to use more reclaimed materials in my work, even for the rug backing, which is excited, exciting. Um, and so, yeah, it's really versatile. I'm very excited with all of the different techniques I've been able to employ. Um, and this is really meaningful work for me. Um, you know, as you said, Susan, I'm from Appalachia um, and living in a rural area in the mountains, we have historically had to make our own luxuries. So geographic isolation, labor abuse and systemic poverty all play a part into generating this make-do culture that we grow up with. You want something lovely, you can make it, but you kind of have to make it for yourself. Um, also, I uh, my family is from Barcelona, Spain. Um, I call myself Hispapalachian because I've lived my entire life in West Virginia, but I have a very like multicultural background. Um, my grandparents also had their share of hardship. Um, they that generation emigrated to the U.S. and Mexico from Barcelona to escape the fascism of Francisco Franco and uh, their, their own make-do attitude and high esteem for art and craft has folded neatly into my perspective as an artist living and making in West Virginia. So if you look at pieces like these that tend to have a little bit more swoopiness to them and really focus on the natural forms you know, whether I mean to or not, um, the aesthetics that I grew up with, as far as um, the aesthetics I grew up with in the context of my family being from Barcelona and the Catalan modernism that was happening at the time and the architecture of the area and these sort of arts and crafts um, skills and aesthetic considerations, they sort of flow into my work. Um, so there's just a lot to talk about with these pieces. Um, and one of the things that I think about the most as I'm, you know, really going through and putting the actual minutes and hand gestures into creating these works is this sort of mixed bag of feelings. It's incredibly satisfying to take something 
that people generally disregard as a scrap or waste and transform it into something beautiful by giving it love and attention. But it is also a way that I deal with my grief about climate and pollutants and living in this time where when I was a kid, we had snow days and now we don't really in my area. I haven't moved a lot geographically, so I've been able to observe the changes in climate and the ecologies around me, even like the small things like different birds that don't show up the same way. I'm not a scientist by any means, but even on like my basic level of observing my natural environment, things have changed just in my lifetime and they're changing faster and faster. So as I'm, you know, pulling loops through the backing, every loop I'm pulling, it's a little bit of processing that grief because it's something that I can do that I can, you know, sit with and so that I can think about these things. And I I love that I can make something that's beautiful and uh, has some ingenuity to it. I love chasing down uh, different curious methods to reuse plastic. There are several pieces that I uh, don't have shown here that might demonstrate like different things. Sometimes I fuse plastic. I have just recently learned how to spin plastic to make different shapes of fibers. So, you know, there's a really wide variety of things that I can enjoy through curiosity and discovery. However, it is also that, you know, sadness and mourning for things that have changed and like my limited agency to make change in this way. So there's just a lot that I think about while I'm while I'm working on these. And I spend a lot of time recreating the natural environment because I feel like it really frames up, you know, what is changing and what we have to lose and why it's lovely and why it might need preserved as well. And I feel like I have gone on for quite a bit, Susan, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, point out any details of the pieces that I have in the slides. Well, I think uh, I think we have seen the slides individually as you were talking, and each time that we saw them, we were listening to a different reason. And um, you went very deep into the purpose, which is the anchor um, for the entire collection, the stories that are made as each person, as you said, processing your grief. Many others have have their own stories. But, but it's the slowness, it's the heritage, it's that connection to um, to different styles, to different ethnic backgrounds, to exploring, and that's the excitement. Mm -hmm. So let's take, uh, take the slides down and put both of us up on the screen again for a little more discussion. I took some notes. I'm sure anyone watching this will have. Thank you. All right. I think we should be back to a normal view of things. We are. Hi again. <laughs> um, I think one of the best things that I kept see, hearing as um, someone who also is a fiber artist, I mix my colors mm -hmm. in a dye pot and you mix your colors by availability. Yeah. And, and sometimes be... mechanically I can twist fibers together to sort of trick the eye a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's definitely the best way of doing it. Um, I have a question, which is, I know you pretty well. So could you just experiment or expand on the fact that you kept telling us you were experimenting on different ways to make these yarns or threads and such. And, oh, I just learned how to uh, spin differently um, for, um, so, you know, kind of like, I think what I wanted to ask everyone is where are you at in your journey now? And I think part of yours is you're exploring, you're experimenting, but you're meeting people too, aren't you? Oh, yes, absolutely. One of the really wonderful things that has come about as I uh, came back to fiber arts as a medium, which I'll back up just a little bit. when. 
I got my training as an artist. I I got my degree as a graphic designer, and I think I spent most of my time painting. The school I went to didn't have a fiber program, so all of the fibers that I have learned are truly heritage. They have been handed down to me by relatives and friends like you, Susan, who taught me how to rug hook. So everybody who has given me a little piece of fiber art, it has been a uh, not formal training. Mm -hmm. You know, my sense of color and composition, that's something that I developed throughout my life, but really deepened in the arts program I was in. But as far as like the techniques that I'm working with now, as I came back to them, yeah, I had taken a really long break from, you know, that sort of fiber arts pursuit because it didn't really make sense with the current context of my life. I work, you know, a lot of hours. I would purchase the objects that would normally be made with fiber arts. I, you know, wasn't a big quilter or anything like that. But as I came back, the more I ran into fiber artists that were working, uh, you know, contemporary working artists, the more I was like surprised and just really delighted to find an openness because my my um, hesitation was like, oh gosh, they're going to see me coming up with this plastic and it's going to be so insulting to them with all of their craft experience and knowledge. And I I don't want them to take it the wrong way <laughs> because I really have a lot of respect for the type of um, both talent and skill that goes into producing the these heritage crafts with the traditional materials. But I was just so excited about trying to find ways to take what's abundant now mm -hmm. and turn it, like use the the thought process that was behind hooked rugs when they came into being, which was reuse, mm -hmm. but then go for a material that was really abundant in contemporary life, which I was just completely surrounded with plastic bags. And I tell you, I bring my tote bags everywhere and the plastic bags still get in. They get in. And, you know, also if you start doing plastic artwork, oh. your friends will save you the good colors. <laughs> There's, so. a, there's a huge bag waiting again and what was it three months ago we saw each other and I dropped off a bag yeah mm -hmm. yeah and I feel like a lot of a lot of my um a lot of folks I know they're very eco-conscious as well they're not trying to get plastic into their lives but it comes but yeah it was really really eye-opening both in being involved with this exhibition um and also with the different um, fiber arts shows uh, and exhibitions and, and retreats I've been able to participate in, I didn't really fully put together before I started how much reuse and make-do attitudes were core to a lot of fiber arts works. Like you can use the best fabric and the best thread and the best conditions and the best machine. You can, and there are people who do, and I think that that's lovely. However, it feels like a lot, a lot of folks are more on the scrappy side because at some point like the thread breaks or you don't have exactly the right fabric and maybe you need to dye it or like you need to knock that collar back a little bit so maybe you wash it or maybe you felt a material down to get a better texture there are just so many techniques that are just making what you need out of what's available especially um you know like I've seen a lot of folks uh recycling sweaters lately if you find mm -hmm. a sweater that is knit in a certain way you can unspool it and yeah. And, you know, even whenever you're making, I know, Susan, you also use a lot of um, materials that were formerly, formerly other garments and you'll like custom dye them for yourself. So you'll do like over dyes and things. And it's just been really lovely getting to meet up with the other artists in your show um, to talk to them about their processes and find like the differences, but also so much common ground. It's just been really, really lovely and encouraging. So I will continue to uh, <laughs> excavate new uses for plastic. We're, right now I'm trying to, um, right now I'm trying to get good at spinning plastic so that I have a different texture to the fibers. Uh, currently I slice them into ribbons and that's why you get that like 
poofy sort of nubbly texture once it's hooked through um but I'm wondering I'm I'm going to be playing with like tighter textures and things like that so my pursuit is always in color and texture the material is great it's just like how can I get those different layers of texture and color I want to do dyeing experiments and there's just a lot of fun stuff to go. I'm also trying to um, teach people how to adapt their sewing practices to plastic as well, because, you know, the material does have its benefits. It's not like you're going to stain it. You know, nothing's going to, I often, when I bring my work places, I will often encourage people to pet it because it's not going to hurt it. <laughs> and it's an interesting texture that you might not run across all the time. Yeah, and it makes so, a sound too, or just holding yeah. it to the light. I love showing your work as we're going around a gallery and, and pointing out to somebody. Now look at it just right here at this angle. Look at how the light shines on that and it's not silk. Remember so-and-so's has a little silk in it or someone else has some hand spun, really wonderful soft yarns. Look at this one and you mm -hmm. can tell there's totally different materials in it. Yeah, and there's so much texture that's available to manage. I tell you, I spend a little too long looking at my bags before I put them in the recycling. There are certain things I'm like, that's really shiny. I'm gonna put that in the stash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found a bag of I found a bag of tinsel at an estate sale. And so now I've been embroidering with tinsel a little bit too. It's it's not as um it's very sharp, so I have to be careful with mm -hmm. it or it'll rip up the fabric or well the plastic. The plastic backing might get damaged if I'm not careful with it, but it's very shiny. Well, you Love recall it. the McDonald sisters that I've studied, they mm -hmm. took apart um Brillo pads. Yes, that was one of the things that made me think that that would work and be cute. <laughs> yes, yes. When we're talking 50 years ago, when it really was copper threads and such, and the wire still has its beautiful shine in all of their work. Uh, so we we do know they didn't use copper threads. They are they are Brillo pads. Brillo pads. Why not? <laughs> you know, they all well, shine. Yeah, I mean, it's it again goes back to how lovely it's been finding like whenever you start digging past like the mass produced craft kit you run into people um with a very similar set of ideas <laughs> of just trying to make something lovely out of whatever is around and i really appreciate that and so as far as like where it's it's been wonderful to meet all of these folks. It's also been really wonderful to help people consider how they might adapt this material into their practices if it's something that they're interested in doing. And then I'm just like still on a super fun, magical adventure of discovery because every time I find a piece of trash, I think about it for a little bit. I'm like, hmm, what could we do with this? Could we do something interesting with this? So yeah, it's it's great. And I am, I feel like I'm very much in the middle of things. I'm really looking forward to trying to make more larger works. Mm -hmm. um, the piece that you have in the show on my belly in the grass, it's not a terribly large work. However, it is one of the three biggest ones that I've made so far. And it taught me a lot about what how far I could push the material and getting those textures to catch the light and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I want to be making larger things uh, now that it'll take a long time, but that's part of the poetry of it is just pouring time, pouring pouring human handwork hours into a material that would normally be in your life for less than 24 hours. So yeah. Yeah. I think that that is terribly funny and I will continue to enjoy it. <laughs> well, and as you referred to it, it is for me, COVID, thank goodness I knew how to do a lot of handwork. Um, yeah. And it was okay for me. I just did a home artist in residency for a couple <laughs> of years. Um, but the creativity happened through through stress, through process, through isolation. Um, I didn't have a problem with the slow process because at the end, there's something visible, as you were saying, instead of tossing that bag or tossing the fast food and everything. Um, it, it's a it's a reminder we can enter our work and it can be um, admired and speaking for us even after us or as we move on let me put it that way yeah well I mean honestly one of the things that has been a huge source of inspiration was something that I had um, some 
mixed feelings about. I have a hope chest that is completely full of heirlooms that I think it goes back possibly three generations. I think I have some things from my great great grandmother, but I, I would have to look again. But when I started going back to my fiber arts and trying to figure out what relevance the techniques had in my current practice and how to bring it forward, I, for the first time since I was 16 and got the dang thing, unpacked my hope chest and held everything in my hands and looked at all of the different stitches and I mean, one of my relatives um, was the the local uh, tailor. So I have, you know, mm. some tatted lace from that workshop that she would have hand tatted. I haven't figured out tatting yet, but I'm oh. working on it. <laughs> yes. I, the fibers are too flat to do tatting, <laughs> but I'm I'm thinking about it. Again, magical adventure of discovery constantly, but I... Oh, you know, there are people I've never met that I have things that they made. I have a material you could use that is wasteful. Um, mm -hmm. The farmers wrap their hay rolls, not anymore with twine. They actually mm -hmm. use a netting, which you might be able to use. But the blue twine is plastic. Oh, and I could probably tat that or at least do fish yeah. nets. Yeah, you just tat bigger, just like yeah. cooking larger. So yeah. So this has become a fascination that I'm just going to continue to explore. And I, I did start with rug hooking, but then especially some of the pieces in the show have like so many other techniques that just play with that texture and dimension that you can get with rug hooking. I just love it when you whenever you can combine different mm -hmm. things into one piece. Um, so <laughs> honestly I'm glad I was in the show because like yay I get to be in a show but also I got to go and look really closely at all of these pieces for a while uh, I'm also really looking forward to the next place that it's displayed because it's a little bit closer to home so I might go visit it a couple of times <laughs> I believe you might be doing a workshop of some sort also uh, exactly so <laughs> so I'll be able to be really nosy and look at the stitches and maybe Maybe if I'm 